All right, guys, Kurt Williams here with the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum in Salt Lake. We're going to show Tim around. Come on in. All right, we're going to kick our tour off here with the early pre-Land Cruiser, which is the BJ, and then over here the FJ25. This is a 1958 FJ25. This is the first model to come to the United States. We're going to talk more about that one a little later, but let's head down the 40 series row. So this is the Land Cruiser that most people in the United States have come to really know as that notariable, that iconic look. It's the Short wheelbase, removable top, did come in a factory soft top version or a hot hard top version. And you'll see, this is one of my favorite views down the museum is looking down this line of hoods. And this represents a lot of change throughout the range of the 40 series. So you start with an early Land Cruiser. This is a 1962 40. This has got a, this is a hard top model. And you'll notice like really lean offerings inside. That's a bench seat. You won't find seat belts. Things like that, a three on the tree column shift. So really a neat truck. And as we move down the line, you're gonna see that the refinement goes up and they get a little more accoutrements, nicer interior, nicer seats, nicer doors. So this is a really beautiful 67 model. You notice the seats inside get a little nicer, a little plusher upholstery. This one's also a three on the tree. The hard top gets a little different look, bigger glass, bigger windows. And at the same time, you could also get a factory soft top version of a Land Cruiser. So a lot of people aren't familiar with that. They're, they're used to this look here, but the factory soft top was also available for quite a few years in the United States, still available outside the United States on various models. Uh, but yeah, the factory soft top, so a nice canvas top and a, and a soft sided door as well. It's so really cool. It's the factory door and the, the way the window just slides up and locks into tracks. So this is Simplicity, a beautiful truck. And this is a 1971. And as we move down the line, a couple more factory soft tops, just a couple different color and trim options. And one big change happened when you go from the bench seat over to the bucket seats. So things are starting to get a little more refined on the interior. This one is just a really cool patina. So obviously uh, Unrestore, it's actually had the patina clear coated, just a really neat faded look. Kind of stands out from the, a lot of the trucks in the museum that are all perfect restorations, but that's a fun one. And then you get into the later 70s, and 1975 was a big change for the Land Cruiser in the United States. You've got a new body, uh, sheet metal. The, the hood changed in a little bit earlier, but this kind of represents a compilation of a lot of those changes. Uh, so the windshield changed, a lot of interior change, got ambulance doors in the back. Uh, 1975, late 75 is when they started adding things like disc brakes to the, to the Land Cruiser. That was a big change at the time. A little bit different turn signal models. And as you keep working your way into the late 70s, they keep getting more and more refined. You're still bucket seats, but the next big change is going to be headrests with the bucket seats. Uh, this, this model is a BJ41, so this is a Japanese market only, a JDM market. And it's got a diesel, a little four-cylinder diesel, only offered in Japan as a 2B. It's kind of a fun one here. This is a BJ42, and this is an LX trim from Australia. One fun thing about it is three wipers, three wiper blades on the bottom. And if you're an FJ Cruiser owner or know FJ Cruisers well, you'll recognize that the FJ Cruiser also had three wipers. And they, a lot of times, uh, FJ Cruiser guys see this, and the, the Land Cruiser was doing that in the 80s, the early 80s even. It's a real fun one. And then the wheelbase uh, starts getting a little longer. So the BJ40, 41, and 42s are the FJ40s, this is the series, all the same wheelbase. Then you jump to the 43, and that wheelbase stretches a little bit. It's a really neat, like, service vehicle. We don't know a whole lot about the history of this one, 
uh, what exactly it was made for. It came out of Japan. It's a JDM Market one. Kind of a few neat things of the fender mount mirrors you'll see on a lot of Japanese spec trucks. Kind of a cool one. This one uh, must have been perhaps military service or like a forestry. Has a central greasing system. So it actually has like grease lines that run to all the Zerk fittings. So you could grease it from all one place in the cab. So it was, had to have been built for some kind of heavy, heavy service. Kind of interesting. And then you come around to a 43 from the opposite end of the globe. This is a Colombian spec. And neat thing about uh, some of the South American markets and other markets around the globe is Toyota exported them from Japan, built them as cab and chassis models. So this truck was all built in Japan from here forward and the cab, but the top, the sides, and the rest of the back were all built in country. And they did that for a variety of reasons. One was because of importation laws and taxes. Uh, the other was to, they built them domestically to kind of outfit them the way they wanted. So that way they could build them as troop carriers. These 43 models are very popular to see in countries like Colombia as a, a taxi, for example. So they would have troop carrier seats in the back rather than a bench seat, and they would use them as a, ca a taxi. And then these two right here, these are beautiful trucks, kind of twins. They're soft top BJ44s. And these, are, these came out of Japan. They have extremely low miles, like maybe I think one's got about 25 and the other has 17,000 kilometers. So very low. These are real neat with the factory PTO winches. These have got the diesels. So neat, uh, neat packages. And the wheelbase is still getting a little longer. So you get the 43, the 44, and then you jump back to the 45s. And the 45 comes in three varieties, a short bed truck, such as this beautiful white one here. This is an early fixed cab. So that cab is non-removable. And then you have a, a later model 45 that is a removable cab long bed truck. So two different bed configurations. And then the other option is called a 45 LV. And we have one of those at the front of the museum, and that's a wagon. <clears throat> and this is a perfect time to kind of illustrate the different options that Toyota has for their market. Short wheelbase truck, long wheelbase truck, a four-door wagon, which would be the LV, and then the two-door utility vehicles, all at the same time. So Toyota in those early days, and still to this day, was a solution provider. If you needed a short bed truck, they got you. Long bed truck, they got you. And all those under the Land Cruiser marquee. So at one time, and still to this day, with the 70 series and the 200, you can get a, a variety of different platforms, whether you need a four-door truck, a two-door truck, a wagon, all available under the same uh, flagship vehicle. Next door to that one is kind of a really interesting one, and this is called a Toyota, or it's, it's called a Bandurante, and it's produced under license from Toyota in Brazil in their local market. So this is a much later model uh, body, the, the, the vehicle this is built on. And Bandurantes were built in country, Again, under license. So while it has a lot of the look of a traditional Land Cruiser, it's built in country by a separate, by Bondurante. So not tre technically a true Land Cruiser. This one's a little best of breed because it does have some drivetrain in underneath it from Toyota. So kind of a really neat truck. And then last we have the, the BJ46. This is also a Japanese domestic market vehicle only, only ever brought to Japan. This is a 1983 see a lot of really interesting parts about it. Again, the fender mount mirrors, the built-in fender flares in the back that are factory, the sliding windows on the hardtop with the extra bonus window behind it. So kind of some really neat stuff. And then the big wide bench seat in the back seat also. So rather than side jump seats like most 40 series would have had, this had a big bench seat. You see a lot with the factory PTO winch. These were available in the US market on a 40 series, uh, but very commonly found outside the US. So that's an engine-driven winch through the, the uh, transfer case. Okay, and then we jump to a troop carrier model in the 45. So we talked about the short bed, long bed, the wagon. Now you have the troop carrier. We never got these in the United States, but extremely common in global markets such as Australia, throughout Africa, uh, Central America where you have a utilitarian vehicle, but you need to move a lot of people or a lot of stuff, a troop carrier makes, makes perfect sense. So they're a really neat uh, package. And this is uh, quite a built up one. This was used to run a, a survival school. So it's not a true uh, Land Cruiser pure specimen. It's got a best of breed with a Toyota turbo diesel. It's got a lot of aftermarket parts on it, but kind of a real uh, built to be a, a useful outback vehicle. Okay, 
And then we move on to one that most people probably aren't really familiar with, particularly in the United States, but even globally. Uh, Land Cruiser guys all know what it is, and that's the FJ55 or the 50 series. You can have an FJ55 or an FJ56. And those names are kind of important. As with the 40 series, generally speaking, and almost always, the first letter of the vehicle is going to be the engine type. So an F would be an F-powered gas motor. A B would be a B-powered uh, diesel, a B-series diesel. And then the 4 would be the, like the 40 series. So like an FJ40 would be a 40 series. And that last digit is the subfamily within the series. So a 40, 41. And generally speaking, as that number gets bigger, the wheelbase grows. Not every time, but, but most of the time. With the 50 series, you have the same thing. So this is an FJ55, so that means it has the F family gas motor. That could be an F or a 2F in this particular case. The J means it's a Land Cruiser, so every Land Cruiser will have a J in their model code. And then the, the 55 is the exact model of this one. This is a really cool one because this has 18,000 original miles. This is probably the lowest mile original FJ55 known in the world. If somebody knows of another one, I'd love to hear about it. Let me know. Ring up Tim, because I want to hear about it. And then you kind of have the polar opposite. This is a FJ55 that was used in Moab as a tour company. Uh, pretty neat. So this thing has hauled mountain bikers, canoers, rafters, all over the backcountry of southern Utah. And kind of fun, because here it is in their advertising poster. So that's not just the same vehicle, that's the exact vehicle. Kind of cool to look at. And while it's not necessarily a pristine museum piece, it's uh, fun to see the two side by side. So the 55 replaced the 45 wagon, which we have down on the end here, as the, the wagon offering for Toyota. So they were still making the utilitarian, the short wheelbase 40, but then they jumped into the 55 as their four-door wagon. So this would have been the family hauler of the uh, late 60s and 70s. And this was available in the U.S. market. You just don't see a lot of them. People often confuse them with international scouts or travel alls, but uh, this is a Toyota Land Cruiser. We'll work our way over here. We'll kind of bounce back a little bit because we do we need to talk about the 45 LV, which is the four-door 45 wagon. And these are just cool. This one has a lot of patina. I wish it could tell stories because I, I have a feeling it survived wars and farm use and all sorts of things. That thing's been uh, hammered. We have a lot of people comment like, hey, is this the best 45 you can find? Well, no, and there'll be a nicer one here eventually, but this one just tells a cool story about Land Cruisers. They're tractors, and outside the world, as you travel and see them in Central America and South America and throughout Africa and Australia, Land Cruisers are work vehicles. They're tractors, and they buy them because they know they're, they're going to get you there, but they're also going to get you home. That's why you buy a Land Cruiser. So we've got to keep going on the wagon train. Still got, uh, you got two more 55s here. Kind of some neat, a late model US spec one. And then an Australian market one here. And that has an ambulance door on the back. So they, could, they came in a lot of different trim configurations. Lift gates in the back, tailgates on 40s, half doors, ambulance doors. And on the 55 as well, you could get a drop down tailgate or ambulance doors. Uh, same with the 60 series, which is what graduated in, in the 1980. The 55 goes away. Toyota's still got to have a four-door wagon offering, so the 60 series comes out. So this would be like an FJ60, which would be a U.S. spec truck in this case. So it's got that same 2F gas power motor, have a four-speed transmission. Uh, and these, these are still a very collectible vehicle. In fact, right now, the 60 series is one of the most collectible in the United States. For a lot of years, you could get a, a rusty but running FJ60 for $1,500, $2,500. But nowadays, they're, even a rusty one's worth four or $5,000. And a really clean one, you're talking high teens and up. And the you know, sky's the limit in an auction environment. And then outside the U.S., the same 60 series was offered in a lot of other varieties, the 61 and the 62. And we did get the FJ62 in the United States. That would have a 3FE gas uh, fuel-injected motor, automatic. But outside, you could get a 12HT, for example. You could get a four-cylinder turbo diesel. A, uh, sorry, a four-cylinder diesel, a six-cylinder diesel, and a six-cylinder turbo diesel. So a lot of variations. And these two are two really cool ones from Japan that show some of those other models. So you got a factory winch. This one's got factory locking differentials front and rear. It's, of course, solid axles, leaf sprung. It's got the turbo diesel, the high roof, factory sunroof. 
heated seats, the, the powered bolster driver seat. So a lot of cool configurations the Land Cruiser came in. Uh, this 1989 HJ60, this is a fun one. This is a six-cylinder non-turbo. It's called the 2H motor. But as you peek inside here, whoever owned this one had a lot of attention to detail. And he had all the seats and the door cards covered in plastic when this vehicle was brand new. So if you poke your head in there, nothing has ever been sat in. The seats are completely covered in plastic. And the door cards are even covered in plastic. So this upholstery is about how it looks as good as, you know, when it was brand new. And there are a little bit of tears in the driver's seat here, just enough that you can look underneath there and see that's like as brand new as Toyota upholstery would ever be. And this truck has 23,000 original kilometers. So that's like about 13, 14,000 miles on this Land Cruiser. So for a 1989 with that low of miles, that's a pretty pristine truck right there. You're not gonna find too many more of those. And that's one of the special parts of the museum is the ability to look at so many low mile and original Land Cruisers and open the doors. And if you're restoring a Land Cruiser, this would be the place to come look and see what color was that bolt, where did that bolt go, how was this assembled. We're not 100% perfect on all the vehicles, but with each iteration, as we find better ones, that is the goal, that they'll each time uh, replace vehicles with one that's a little nicer. Or if you just want to learn about Land Cruisers, this is a great place to come spend an afternoon and walk through the rows and get to know it all. Another HJ61, and then a big jump. So the 40 series, which was the utilitarian short wheelbase vehicle, that first row, had ended in 1984, but Toyota wasn't done with a heavy duty short wheelbase vehicle. So in 1985, they launched the 70 series. And the 70 series is still available to this day. So 1984, late 84 launch, all the way through current, they make the 70 series. And the 70 series, uh, you kind of see on the illustration here, is available in short wheelbase, soft tops, hard tops, mid wheelbases, four doors, troop carriers, trucks, and even a four door truck not shown on here. So it's, it's got an amazing variety of platforms still offered depending on markets around the globe. We don't get any 70 series in the US, we never did. Uh, we did get a few in North America being Canada. They got the BJ70, which is a non-turbo uh, 3B diesel. Uh, neat, very neat trucks. It's the short wheelbase that they got, which would be this variety. But globally, they still offer lots. So we'll, we'll kind of run through the line. So these are BJ70s. This is gonna be a factory soft top and a factory hard top. This is kind of a fun one because this was a golf course, a country club pros vehicle at a, at a golf course in Japan. And this one, you notice that it's got like little narrow pizza cutter tires on the front and a big knobby on the back. Well, that's because this truck doesn't have power steering. This is a total base model package available in the mid 80s, which is crazy that you could still get a non-power steering cruiser. This thing doesn't even have a tack. It's got a speedometer only. It's got an AM radio, vinyl seats, vinyl floors, so it was just a true utilitarian package, which is cool, but it had a winch, and that's kind of fun. So we finish up with the utilitarian model, which is the BJ70, and on the flip side, you have this BJ71. This is also a Japanese domestic market vehicle, right-hand drive, but this thing's a fully loaded, so it's got a lot of neat trim, uh, the turbo diesel motor, it's got the inclometer, the compass on the dash, uh, you know, a lot different system, uh, power doors, power mirrors. So it just shows you the variety that are available side by side in those markets. Also, you could get the short wheelbase, long wheelbase uh, in, in simultaneously too. And then this is kind of an interesting breakoff point is the light duty Land Cruiser, which is also known as the Prado. It's called a few different names around, uh, but it is like the Land Cruiser Prado series. And this is really the start of the two different directions that the Land Cruiser went in the mid 80s. And that is a lighter duty drivetrain underneath here. So it's got smaller axles and a smaller motor. From the A pillar back, it is the same body, but from the A pillar forward, it has a little bit different front end. So you notice it kind of has a wide body versus a narrow body. But the big differences are when you pop the hood. These are gonna have a smaller displacement four cylinder motor, also available in gas. But the big thing is you climb underneath and instead of having the, the Land Cruiser axles, which were traditionally a big nine and a half inch differential front and rear, these have eight inch axles front and rear. So this would be parallel to like a US spec forerunner at the same vintage. Uh, and that's called the Land Cruiser Prado. And still to this day, that Prado uh, is made all the way through current as a light duty Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser Prado. Kind of a neat variation. We've got two different ones here. One's kind of, kind of twinners. And then we flip around and the Prado got a lot of facelifts over time. So this is gonna be a newer four-door Prado model, or sorry, a newer uh, two-door Prado model, but the newer rounded out front end. 
And this is an LJ71, so it's the same wheelbase, but the, the one in the 71 denotes that it's got a factory turbo. So this has got a, the, uh, the LT turbo system in it. It's a, they're fun little trucks. They're lighter duty, lighter trucks. Um, the 2LT pushes around just fine, but they struggle a little bit when they get loaded up and built. Uh, the the heavy-duty Land Cruiser line seat does a little better with the bigger motor, the bigger axles. Uh, but, so that's 71. We don't have a 72 series here. They do make a 72 Prado base that we need to track down. But then you jump to the 73. So the 73 and 74 are mid-wheel base models. 73 is a factory soft top. 74, uh, this is a 73 factory soft top. 73 is a non-turbo variant. So this one has a gas motor, but non-turbo. The 74 is the same wheelbase, but with a turbo diesel. So this has a four-cylinder turbo diesel. So BJ74, that's that 13BT, the J series, meaning a Land Cruiser. 70 series is the seven, and four is that wheelbase variant. Then you jump to the 75, and that is a pickup truck. This does have a customer bed on it, but this is a very, very indicative of kind of a truck that is still quite popular around the globe, and that's the 75 series pickup. These are all over Australia, all over Central America, and all over Africa. Very popular trucks. And this has the 1.8Z motor in there, which has been uh, still made to this day. So Toyota's used that, that drivetrain for just about 30 years. Crazy uh, how long that motor's been in production. The 1.8Z, and it's a fantastic diesel. It's a six-cylinder, non-turbo, but uh, it gets around just fine. Then we jump back to the Prado, so you can see that narrower front end, and this is an LJ78 with a 2LT. This is a four-door model. There's actually kind of twinners here. So a 90 and 91 LJ78, it's both kind of real clean uh, early Prados. And then you jump to the four-door in the Land Cruiser variety, and this is a GRJ76. So this is a really neat vehicle. In 2015, Toyota announced that they were re-releasing the 70 series as a 30th anniversary. And a lot of people all of a sudden got excited about that, like, oh, maybe they'll release it in the United States. Well, what that was was a release in Japan only. The 70 series was still being made globally and distributed globally to a lot of countries. But in Japan, it hadn't been for a few years. And the 30th anniversary was a model made just for the Japan market. So what we have here is a GRJ 76 and 79. 76 is the four-door. The 79 can be a two-door truck or a four-door truck. This one, a four-door. And these have six and seven miles on them, respectively. Six and seven kilometers. So these are brand new as they would have been delivered in Japan. And one really interesting thing about these, when you pop the hood, these have the GR motor, the one GRFE motor, which is the exact same motor as an FJ Cruiser. A lot of years of Tacomas had, the second-gen Tacomas. Uh, so that, that 4.0 motor, the FJ Cruiser came with that. So it's a great motor, uh, but that's what this ones were delivered with in Japan. You can also get these in different markets with a turbo diesel, uh, a, a, a V8 turbo diesel. So kind of a cool package. These have factory locking discs front and rear. They also have a factory Toyota electric winch. So really a neat package. I'd love this truck, but alas, only available in certain markets. And then the four-door variant's kind of a fun one too. These are solid axles in the front. Again, locking discs front and rear with the 4.0 gas motor. Coil suspension front, leaf sprung rear. A neat package. So that kind of covers the 70 series. We've gone all the way from 70 to 79. So the next big jump is the 80 series. We did get the 80 in the US. So we went from 40 to 55 to 60. The 60 ended in 1990. We get the 80 series. So. A little bit of overlap as you work your way around the globe. It kind of takes a map to sort it all out. This is a really cool one that just kind of came in the museum. And this is a, what's called a Maltec Conversion 80 series. So this was built by a company that makes these camper conversions on the back half. That's so a full living solution in the back with the pop-up tent. Kind of a fun one. But more historically speaking, you would look at the Land Cruiser in the U.S. as this one right here. And this is a really popular model. This is a 40th anniversary, which is a 1997. This is the 40th anniversary of the Land Cruiser proper. And the 80 series was a big change from the previous 60 series. The 60 still had leaf spring suspension and a lot more uh, 
utilitarian motor under the hood, a lot less stuff. But face it, as cars got newer, so did the electronics, so did the vacuum hose, the emission systems, everything underneath the hood got a lot more complex. And when the 80 series debuted in 1990 as a 91 model, it was called an FJ80 in the United States, all previous Land Cruiser owners quickly disowned them. Like, no way, that thing's a soccer mom mobile. And fast forward all these years, the 80 series is known as one of the most robust, like absolutely fantastic off-road. It's a great best of breed. It's comfortable on the road, but these make fantastic off-road vehicles as well. Coil suspension all the way around, so they're very easy to modify. Uh, the, the motors are stalwart. The 3FE and the later 1FZ were great motors, so the 80s come to be known as one of the best off-road vehicles ever made from Toyota, uh, but when they first came out, it really shook some people, and you know, true die-hard Land Cruiser enthusiasts still don't necessarily consider these you know, true Land Cruisers, but they are. They're great vehicles. Uh, and then we kind of jump back to a Prado, so that's the 80 series, and then you have the 90, and the 90 is available as a 90 and a 95, these are the 90 series, 90 is going to be a two-door, 95 is going to be a four-door, these are both VZJ models, so these have a 5VZ FE, it's the same 3.4 liter that like a uh, Tacoma would have had from 96 to 04 or a 96 to 02 4Runner, so a super well-known V6 Toyota motor, but in the Prado lineup. So these are really synonymous. These would be parallel to a U.S. spec 4Runner from the same years. In fact, you fire them up and they have that exact same sound that you come to expect out of here in a 4Runner. Just a great sounding motor. Uh, but this is the Prado. They did really start labeling as such in the later years. You know, putting Land Cruiser Prado with the bars. This is, uh, these are both JDM market ones. So you see the, the fender mount mirrors and a lot of the, the, the factory Toyota fog lights on the front. Kind of neat uh, trinkets. So after the 80 series in the U.S., which ran from 90 to 97, in 1998, we get the 100 series Land Cruiser. And if you thought the early Land Cruiser guys were mad when it went to coils and the big wagon 80, they were really mad because this got an IFS front end, independent front suspension. And that broke a lot of hearts of Land Cruiser owners because they thought, hey, real Land Cruisers have solid axles. But the 100 series, much like the 80, has been become known as one of the best off-road vehicles out there. Uh, particularly for like those that enjoy uh, long distance travel called overlanding. Uh, they're not a rock crawling truck. It's a big wagon, but for uh, bombing down dirt roads, heading down to Mexico or doing a big global trip, it's hard to beat a hundred series. They've got a lot of room. They're very refined and the drivetrain on them is super robust. So they are fantastic platforms. So this would be a, just a U.S. spec 100 series. They did get a mild refresh in the later years of the 100 that got them a little more power out of the VVTi motor. They went from a 4-speed to a 5-speed. This would be a later Model 1. Of course, this one is quite built up. This has got bumpers, suspension, rack, lights, a lot of goodies on it. But this is the, uh, the little bit later front end designed to just change some of the grill hood. And then outside the U.S., they had what was called the 105. So we had the 100 series, 98 to 07, but they got what was called a 105 series. The 105, if you peek underneath, still has a solid axle. So we never got this in the United States. This is an Australian spec. It's a really, uh, really utilitarian model here again. Not, not a whole lot of uh, amenities inside. Cloth seats, still a kind of a real utilitarian truck. And then in 2008, the Land Cruiser shifts to the 200 series. It goes from the 100 to the 200. So from 2008 to current is the 200 series. This is an Australian spec truck. So this is called a VDJ200. And this has the 1VD FTV twin turbo diesel. So it's a V8 twin turbo diesel from the factory. Of course, this one's a quite heavily modified truck. Got a lot of neat stuff on it. And this was part of a company called HEMA. They do uh, mapping and map softwares and applications. They do some amazing, cool mapping. And this was one of their map patrol vehicles. They drove all over Australia and then brought this one over the United States to map 4x4 routes. So this one was able to find a home after its mission here in the museum. We'll kind of do a quick glance at the, this is the Expedition 7 fleet in the back. There are, there's uh, two 79s, sorry, 179, two 78s, uh, a 76, uh, a 79 kind of hybrid that were all part of the original Expedition 7 fleet. And these are the vehicles that drove on all seven continents. The middle one there, its name's Fernway, is its truck's name, uh, drove on all seven. So that is the one four-wheel vehicle that's done all seven continents. So kind of a cool platform. Um, these first four all have that 1VD FTV, which is the, uh, the 
V8 turbo diesel. The last one is a six cylinder turbo diesel. And then the truck on the end kind of hidden is a, a, what's called an Arctic truck AT44. You'll have to come back for that video because that'll be a fun one too. And then this last row here at the museum is kind of mutt row, like loosely affiliated DNA or kind of one-off trucks. So starting here with the Q truck. And this is actually one of my favorites here at the museum. It's not a Land Cruiser, but it's just really cool. And this is kind of the grandfather of the Tundra. And if you look at that, that is Toyota's offering of a full-size truck that came out in the late 50s. This is a 1962 model. You can see a lot of similarities to other vehicles of the time, like a Dodge Power Wagon, but this is a purely manufactured by Toyota and a really a neat pickup truck. We'll have to come back and visit that one too. And then you got a few of the micro SUVs. This is called a Delta Mini Cruiser. These were built in the Philippines. Not a whole lot of Land Cruiser DNA on there other than they were built to look like Land Cruisers. And then you have the Blizzards. We've got a few Blizzards. Again, Blizzards have a little bit of Land Cruiser DNA, the bezel, kind of the, the way that the two-tone top, but not a true Land Cruiser. And they weren't called one, they were called Blizzards. And these were kind of Toyota's answer to the micro SUVs of the time, the Suzuki Samurai. Uh, they're actually built in cooperation with Daihatsu, and they're uh, Daihatsu Wildcats, but Toyota had some involvement with them at the time. So you've got the early blizzard, the hard top, and the soft top. And then you kind of have this neat one here, which is called a Toyota PX10. And this was a really low volume special project. This was built by Toyota's body company, built in-house. And these were built to kind of test the market for a modern style of SUV that had a little bit of some of the characteristics of an FJ40. So you'll notice the bezel, just like a 40, the turn signals that are right off of an FJ40 from the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the, the white top, kind of the hood design, has a lot of a 40 series going on there. But this is a 1997 model. So this was built 25 years later, which is kind of cool to see, or sorry, 15 years later after the, 15 years after the last of the 40 series. So kind of neat. And then a few years later, they sample the market and introduce the FGA, the FGA Cruiser. And the FGA Cruiser is a really neat one. A lot of people contest the fact that it's in the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum because it is an FGA Cruiser, but they are fantastic vehicles. The FGA Cruiser brought a lot of people to the Toyota brand. So a lot of first time 4x4 owners bought FGA Cruisers. They were great off road. They sold really well. They held their value really well. And still to this day, they've got great following. So events, events that are inspired just around the FGA Cruiser around the globe. So neat trucks. And then kind of a few more. These are all Land Cruisers, but it's kind of specialty ones. So this was one built by a gentleman to kind of be his end all uh, you know, survivalist cruiser. This thing has its biodiesel. It's got a night vision FLIR camera, remote controlled spotlight. This thing has electrical, uh, you know, full onboard system to do everything. And you can kind of survive out of this guy out in the middle of nowhere. This is a, uh, this is a BJ74, which would traditionally be a two-door, but this was built as a four-door. And that was built by Toyota's body company. It was really low volume and it was built for Nagoya diesel. So it was kind of a specialty vehicle. But a few years after they built these and sold them to just select clients, uh, mostly in the mining industry, Toyota came out with their own four-door 70 series. So I think it's fair to say they were kind of using these to sample the market for a four-door 70. This is a 73 that was used in a race in Australia. Kind of just a really typical Australian build. This would be something you'd see all over Australia as a 70 series built like this. Big bar, lots of lights, the antennas on the front bumper, the snorkel, kind of a real Australian look. And then our two service vehicles. And this neat part about the Land Cruiser is how it's used for so many different reasons around the globe. It can be a fire truck, a police truck, an ambulance, uh, antenna repair vehicle for a television. This is a CNN affiliate in Japan. That's a big antenna mast, and there's a full electrical workstation in the back of this one for a gentleman to, to work on antennas and do uh, communication work. So this is a, like a service vehicle. And then, of course, you have fire trucks. This, in particular, is a FJ56. So this is a Japanese spec 50 series that was built as a fire truck. Um, a lot of configurations you can find 40 series, 50 series, 60, 70, 80, 100, and 200 fire vehicles that are used for fire departments. So still to this day, the Land Cruiser is a popular service vehicle, which is kind of cool that they have an option for so many different service uh, platforms. 
So that kind of covers the basic ones. We'll do a quick glance over at the, uh, a few of the others in the collection. We'll start here. These two, these are Toyotas. We'll start with the end one here. This is Toyota's answer to a light mobility vehicle for their military, for the Japanese Defense Force. So this is called a Toyota Mega Cruiser. A lot of people look at those, and of course they think Humvee, uh, and definitely inspired by the design. We are a partner nation with Japan, our militaries, so it's, it's no doubt that uh, we were looking to have, or Toyota was looking to have a design similar to the Humvee, but built in country. They are right-hand drive as well, so they can be driven in, in countries that are right-hand drive only. Uh, neat thing about the, hum, the, uh, the Toyota Mega Cruiser, it's got four-wheel independent suspension all the way around, has four-wheel steering, so the rear turns as well, so they had a lot tighter turning radius than most uh, vehicles of their class, and it does have portal reduction hubs, so it has insane ground clearance, so factory locking this front and rear, it's got a little four-cylinder diesel, uh, and yeah, they, they're just a, a great platform. And they made a very limited number, less than 300, of the BXD-20. That's the BXD-10 Mega Cruiser. The BXD-20 is a civilian version. So they made a very small number of the civilian ones, and we're lucky to have a civilian one here in the museum. They're kind of fun to poke your head in. They're insanely wide. They look every bit as wide as you're seeing on your camera. You know, if you get two people in there, they can barely fist bump across the middle. Tim and I will climb in there later and show that off. And then we'll sneak back to the crawler row. These are kind of the fun ones. Not pure Toyota DNA, but they're just fun. And this is actually a four-door aluminum 40 series body on a Mega Cruiser chassis. So this kind of really gives you a good look at how much ground clearance those Mega Cruisers have. This one, of course, has larger tires, but four-wheel steering, four-wheel independent suspension, lockers front and rear, and the portal reduction hub. So really neat. And then you have the Lizard King, as it's known. The Lizard King is just a big land cruiser. It's got... Uh, Two and a half ton Rockwell axles. This is a V8 uh, with a GM V8. Just a whole lot of Land Cruiser. And a few more crawlers here as well. I get the Bug, which is a really neat one. And Big Red down on the end. You can learn more about the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum online. The website's Land Cruiser HM, as in Heritage Museum, landcruiserhm.com, or just Google Land Cruiser Heritage Museum. I'm sure it'll pop up. We're on Facebook. We're actually on Yelp and several of the other uh, different uh, review platforms. So if you do make it out, we'd love to hear about your experience here. We do an annual event each year called Cruiser Fest, which is all things celebrating the Land Cruiser. It happens annually uh, in September. So if not this year, we'd love to have you out in a future year. Come out to Cruiser Fest and enjoy all things Land Cruisers. Hey, thanks for watching this video from the Total Land Cruiser Museum. I hope you really enjoyed it. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for more Pickup Truck Plus SUV news and different stories I do. Hit subscribe to follow along and find the playlist down below. There'll be a playlist of different museum videos I'm doing. Th again, thanks for watching. We'll see you down the road.